Section eight from Richard of Jamestown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Richard of Jamestown A Story of the Virginia Colony by James Otis. Section eight. Captain Smith Gains Authority. There was but little idle talk made by the members of the council in deciding that Master Wingfield should be deprived of his office, and Master Ratcliffe said in his place, Captain Smith was called upon to take his proper position in the government, and what was more, to him they gave the direction of all matters outside the town, which was much the same as putting him in authority over even the President himself. It was greatly to my pleasure that Captain Smith lost no time in exercising the power which had been given him, nor was he at all gentle in dealing with those men who disdained to soil their hands by working, yet were willing to spend one day, and every day, searching for gold, without raising a finger toward adding to the general store, but at the same time claiming the right to have so much of food as would not only satisfy their hunger, but minister to their gluttony. Nathaniel and I heard our master talking over the matter with the preacher, on the night the council had given him full charge of everything save the dealings which might be had later in the London Company. Therefore it was that we knew there would be different doings on the morrow. Greatly did we rejoice thereat, for Jamestown had become as slovenly and ill-kempt a village as ever the sun shone upon. Now it must be set down that these gentlemen of ours, when not searching for gold, were wont to play at bowls in the lanes and paths, that they might have amusement while the others were working, and woe betide the serving man or laborer who by accident interfered with their sports. On this day, after the conversation with Master Hunt, all was changed. Captain Smith began his duties as guardian and director of the village by causing it to be proclaimed through the mouth of Nicholas Scott, our drummer, that there would be no more playing at bowls in the streets of Jamestown while it was necessary that very much work should be performed, and this spoken notice also stated that whosoever dared to disobey the command should straightway be clapped into the stocks. Disagreeable Measures of Discipline Lest there should be any question as to whether my master intended to carry out this threat or no, William Laxon, one of the carpenters, was forthwith set to work building stocks in front of the tent where lived Master Ratcliffe, the new president of the council. Nor was this the only change disagreeable to our gentlemen, which Captain Smith brought about. No sooner had Nicholas Scott proclaimed the order that whosoever played at bowls should be set in the stocks, then he was commanded to turn about and announce with all the strength of his lungs, so that every one in the village might hear and understand, that those who would not work should not have whatsoever to eat. Verily this was a hard blow to the gentlemen of our company, who prided themselves upon never having done with their hands that which was useful. One would have thought my master had made this rule for his own particular pleasure, for straightway those of the gentlemen who could least hold their tempers in check, gathered in the tent which Master Wingfield had taken for his own, and there agreed among themselves that if Captain Smith persisted in such brutal rule, they would overturn all the authority in the town, and end by setting the captain himself in the stocks which William Laxon was then making. It so chanced that Master Hunt overheard these threats at the time they were made, and like a true friend and good citizen, reported the same to Captain Smith. Whereupon my master chose a certain number from among those of the gentlemen who had become convinced that sharp measures were necessary if we of Jamestown would live throughout the winter, commanding that they make careful search of every tent, cave, hut, or house in the village, taking therefrom all that was eatable and storing it in the log-house which had been put up for the common use. Then he appointed Kellum Throgmorton, a gentleman who was well able to hold his own against any who might attempt to oppose him, to the office of guardian of the food. 
giving strict orders that nothing whatsoever which could be eaten should be given to those who did not present good proof of having done a full day's labor. Of course, the people who lay sick were excused from such order, and Master Hunt was chosen to make up a list of those who must be fed, yet who were not able to work by reason of illness. Signs of Rebellion now it can well be understood that such measures as these caused no little in the way of rebellion, and during the two hours Nicholas Scott cried the proclamation through the streets and lanes of the village, the gentlemen who had determined to resist Captain Smith were in a fine state of ferment. It was as if a company of crazy men had been suddenly let loose among us. Not content with plotting secretly against my master, they must needs swagger about, advising others to join them in their rebellion, and everywhere could be heard oaths and threats, in such language as was like to cause honest men's hair to stand on end. For a short time Nathaniel Peacock and I actually trembled with fear, believing the house of logs would be pulled down over our heads, for no less than a dozen of the so-called gentlemen were raging and storming outside. But disturbing Captain Smith not one whit, he sat there, furbishing his matchlock, as if having nothing better with which to occupy his time, but as can well be fancied, drinking in every word of mutiny which was uttered. Then, as if he would saunter out for a stroll, the captain left the house, which was much the same as inviting these disorderly ones to attack him, but they lacked the courage, for he went to the fort without being molested. THE SECOND PROCLAMATION it seemed to me as if no more than half an hour had passed before Nicholas Scott was making another proclamation, and this time to the effect that whosoever, after that moment, was heard uttering profane words, should have a canful of cold water poured down his sleeve. On hearing this, the unruly ones laughed in derision, and straightway began to shout forth such a volley of oaths as I had never heard during a drunken brawl in the streets of London. It was not long, however, that they were thus allowed to shame decent people. Down from the fort came Captain Smith, with six stout men behind him, and in a twinkling there was a hot a fight within twenty paces of Master Ratcliffe's tent, as could be well imagined. And the result of it all was, much to the satisfaction of Nathaniel and myself, that every one of these men who had amused themselves by uttering the vilest of oaths, had a full can of the coldest water that could be procured, poured down the sleeve of his doublet. The method of doing it was comical, if one could forget how serious was the situation. Two of my master's followers would pounce upon the fellow who was making the air blue with oaths, and throwing him to the ground, hold him there firmly while the third raised his arm and carefully pulled the water down the sleeve. Now you may fancy that this was not very harsh treatment, but I afterward heard those who had been thus punished say that they would choose five or six stout lashes on their backs, rather than take again such a dose as was dealt out on that day after John Smith was made captain and commander, or whatsoever you choose to call his office, in the village of Jamestown. Building a Fortified Village There is little need for me to say that these were not the only reforms which my master brought about. After having waited long enough for our lazy gentlemen to understand that unless they set their hands to labor, they could not eat from the general store, he straightway set these idle ones to work building houses, declaring that if the sickness which had come among us was to be checked, our people must no longer sleep upon the ground or in caves where the moisture gathered all around them. He marked out places whereon log dwellings should be placed in such manner that when the houses had been set up, they would form a square. And as I heard him tell Master Hunt, it was his intention to have all the buildings surrounded by a palisade in which should be many gates. Thus, when all was finished, he would have a fort-like village, wherein the people could rest without fear of what the savages might be able to do. By the time such work was well under way, and our gentlemen laboring as honest men should, after learning that it was necessary so to do unless they were willing to go hungry, Captain Smith set about adding to our store of food, 
for it was not to be supposed that we could depend for any length of time upon what the Indians might give us, and the winter would be long. End of section 8